everybody, Nate Warfield here. Um, full disclosure, I have a confession to make. If you read the abstract in the schedule, this talk is very different than what I had there. Um, I chose to give a little bit more uh, informational stuff. I wanted you to learn something and to take away more than just me yammering on about some technology stuff. So with that said, um, technological problems, there we go. So who I am, um, so like I said, my name is Nate Warfield. You saw me this morning talking with Mark. Uh, whoop. Where we go again? All right. So I used to work for Microsoft. Uh, I was a senior researcher for Windows Defender ATP. Um, before that, I spent about four and a half years pushing out patches for the MSRC on Patch Tuesday. So I always like to say you're welcome, and I'm also sorry. Um, if it had a logo at a website between 2016 and 2020, I probably ran it. Um, if you want to know more about that, just come find me later. So. Um, I've been a network hacker researcher for 20 something years. Um, I'm also the subject of a bunch of deep fakes on account of one of my Intel guys who's decided that I'm the next uh, star of the Vikings TV show. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to keep this a little bit light. I know it's afternoon. I want to keep you awake so you guys can have fun tonight. Um, I'm a conference speaker. So I was actually here at BrewCon about three years ago. Um, I've done Kaspersky SAS, B-Sides, Blue Hat, a whole bunch of other ones that are too many to name. And then as we mentioned, uh, I helped start CTI League last year. Um, we actually got written up and wired for it, which was pretty cool. We got to be on a panel with Dr. Fauci in the U.S., which was kind of neat. Um, the 25 groups and people that were doing good things in 2020. So what I'm really going to tell you about today uh, is some of the techniques and tricks that we use in CTI League that I was doing beforehand and I planned on talking about in 2020. Um, just to sort of do your own threat, threat assessment, perimeter assessments, figure out what the holes in your network before somebody like me, who's not nice like me, comes and breaks into your network. Um, so why is this important? Um, we constantly are losing this fight against ransomware. This is something we saw at Defender when I was at Microsoft. This is something we see at many of the company that I switched to back in March. Um, we're always losing, right? We're very rarely do you hear somebody getting ahead of ransomware. Um, they're getting in, they're dwelling, they're having all this time to get into people's networks and nobody notices it until their screens turn, you know, a skull and crossbones. Uh, supply chain attacks. Another thing, if you all remember SolarWinds earlier this year, of course it wasn't the first, um, but it's becoming more prevalent, right? We saw SolarWinds, we saw it was a Kaseya. Uh, attackers are realizing that if they can't get into the company they want, just get into the suppliers, backdoor through it. Um, this is gonna continue, this isn't new, but it's gonna get worse, I promise you. Um, and then some of the security solutions that we've relied on, and especially some of the black box, pro black box products that I'm gonna show you how we found, um, those things have vulnerabilities, right? Every day we're seeing Citrix, Netscalers, VMware, all these different things that are being found to have vulnerabilities that are getting owned and people are getting in through them. Um, it's also pretty impossible, and this will be towards the end, I'll kind of get into this, but it's really hard to know what your partner's security solution and their stance is, right? You can ask them, they might tell you, um, but especially if you're doing mergers and acquisitions or you're like doing VPN connectivity between other businesses for all this B2B stuff, um, knowing what their network looks like, you know, the same thing, like if you'd known that SolarWinds had malware in their software, you probably wouldn't have installed their software, now would you? Um, and then with COVID and remote working, um, like, like I said, I was a network engineer for a bunch of years and my perimeter was my data center. It was my, you know, all of the stuff that was sort of my kingdom. Now with COVID, your perimeter is not only that, but it's your dual cloud or hybrid cloud. It's all your remote workers. And uh, the gentleman that was up here earlier talking about all these Netgear vulnerabilities he's finding or these router vulnerabilities he's finding. Like there's guys out there like that that aren't nice like that. They're gonna try to get into your remote workers network and then piggyback through that into your network. So, so that's the sort of context why we're at, where we're at. On to the risk. So I'm going to start off with a bunch of stuff from Shodan. Does anybody, quick show of hands, does anybody use Shodan or know what it is? Sweet. So you guys are going to be a little bit bored with some of this stuff and hopefully you'll learn something. Um, Dang, man, I should just stop with this clicker. Um, so this is one thing here, unpatched systems, right? We, these are Netscaler vulnerabilities, vulnerable Netscalers we can find on Shodan. Um, some of the Azure enterprise risk, right? I work for Microsoft. Microsoft leaves a quarter billion customer records exposed in a cloud instance. When I was here three years ago, I was literally talking about Elasticsearch like being left open to the internet, and then two years later, Microsoft does it. <laughs> so the irony was not lost on me here. Um, network hardware, right? You can do, these are all qu qu queries. You can go around on Shodan if you want. You'll find this stuff too, right? Telnet open on Cisco routers. What I clipped out was some of them actually have the password in the login banner of the Telnet to the router. <laughs> so if you think that that's not a problem, 
come talk to me later. Um, server ILO, and this is something we kind of know about, but I wanted to highlight it because with remote work and with people um, not being in the office, turning on ILO ports for your data centers is becoming more common, right? I've seen people saying, well, if I can't, I'm not in the office or my servers are in my office, I can't go there anymore with COVID. So they turn on ILO and they open up to the internet. Right? Makes sense for you know, the world we live in, but as a security standpoint, it's not a good idea. And then the black box products, which is what I'm really gonna go beat up right now. So I'm gonna start um, a couple years ago, uh, Citrix. Um, everybody works knows what a Citrix device is. Have you all heard of these things? Big, expensive black box load balancers, firewalls, VPN concentrators, WAFs. You, know, you spend $100,000, it's supposed to do everything. It also gets owned. Um, so they found this vulnerability that was disclosed by Citrix in December of last year, or 2019, I should say. Um, nobody really noticed it, right? I didn't even notice it. And I always kind of keep an eye out for this stuff because it's my thing. Um, but then in January of last year, as everybody was starting to realize <laughs> where the world was going, this guy from Tripwire writes this really detailed blog piece about it, including how to exploit it, essentially. Like, it wasn't quite POC, but it was pretty much POC. Um, so... I read this and I'm like, all right, this is going to be a problem. Um, I go and talk to the guys from Gray Noise and say, hey, let's go put, throw a signature in here because we know what the exploit looks like. Let's get this in as fast as we can and see how long it's going to take before people start like indiscriminately throwing this payload. It took one day. <laughs> Literally one day after the signature was in there, they saw automated exploitation attacks going against these net scalers. Um, this was then confirmed by TrustedSec, who a couple of days later had found the same stuff going on um, in one of their honeypots. The fun thing, and the screenshot you're looking at on the lower left, is actually from the gray noise back end. I asked them if they'd give me the very first instance that they saw. And then a few weeks, like a week later, after people had been going through Citrix's guidance to say, add these different things into the HTTP config to block this weird, you know, dot, dot, semicolon uh, path traversal attack, attackers started changing it. And you'll notice that one that flew in there, they started using a URL encoding because it was to bypass this thing. Uh, and we picked that up also, you know, so a week later, people are evading it, gray noise is picking it up. The interesting timeline about this is the Tripwire article came out on a Thursday or Wednesday. So by Friday, like automated exploitation had happened. If you hadn't been paying attention, you could have easily, you would come back on Monday and you'd find out that your net scaler was owned like pretty much entirely. Cause this is, this is a vulnerable, this is a POC that fits in a tweet. Then, <laughs> and this is one that we worked on heavily in the CTI league. Um, roll fast forward the clock to June. Anybody heard of an F5 device? <laughs> So these, F5 is uh, one of Citrix's biggest competitors. They make the same type of stuff. It's a big overpriced piece of network hardware that does everything, including getting owned. Well, June 30th, they post this you know, security advisor saying, hey, we've got this vulnerability in our web UI and it's very long and it's basically doesn't tell you anything. It's also a pass reversal against the management UI. That's the POC. <laughs> it's not really hard. Um, so we ended up working pretty much in the United States. It was the 4th of July weekend. So the June 30th was a Wednesday or Thursday. We start working on it. We actually get this POC from someone at NCC group. I think it was July 3rd. And then CTI League members worked the entire weekend trying to pull devices out of, out of Shodan, trying to figure out which ones were on healthcare networks, trying to call people, which, you know, 4th of July, if you're not familiar with Americans, we just drink beer and shoot fireworks. So getting a hold of somebody who wants to stop drinking beer and shooting off fireworks to go and patch their F5 device, pretty much impossible. Um, but at least we put a lot of emails in their mailbox so they could not only have a hangover, but some really bad news on Monday. <laughs> Um, now, in fairness to F5, not to, not to totally diss them, I did work for them for a bunch of years, they do tell people don't point this management interface to the internet. Um, we found like 10,000 people that hadn't listened to that advice. <laughs> the other tricky part about this was that their management interface runs on like a dedicated one gig interface. However, when you set it up the way they tell you to, it also enables the management interface on what are essentially the HSRP floating addresses on each device. So if you've got those open to the internet and you think your management interface was off the internet, you're wrong. Um, a very large Redmond software company that I used to work for had a bunch of their customers get hit with this too, allegedly. So when we dug into this, this F5 one was really interesting to me. Um, the first one, you know, I'm gonna back up real quick here for you. So this TMSH thing, um, what that is is basically, if you notice the middle POC command, 
they have what they call their traffic management shell, right? So you see traffic management user interface, this is the GUI. Traffic management shell was a JSP implementation of a full command line client for the device that has zero documentation on any F5 website. In fact, if you search this thing on Google, the only thing you will find is this exploit. <laughs> like nobody seems to know why it's there. So we get in and it turns out the researcher that found it had found an entirely different POC that attacked the HSQL DB like back end, which is where they store all their configuration stuff. Nobody seems to know where this other exploit came out from, right? 24 hours later, there was an exploit in the wild for something nobody had ever heard of, and it wasn't even the thing that the guy from Russia had found. So who know? I don't even know where this came from. Um, the interesting part about it was because it was so automated, and I apologize for the eye chart here, what we started seeing in the log messages was attackers weren't just, they're being very crafty, right? You don't need C2, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you don't need like an interactive C2 when you can just create a user on the device that's a valid user. So within about three or four days, when we're doing forensics on some of these NIF5 devices, we're seeing all these log messages of the user already exists, the user already exists. Like they were going so well that they'd already hit the device once and they'd come back again and they were trying to add the same username a second time, right? I mean, this is how, this is all unfolding in like a week. Um, the other fun thing, <laughs> F5 didn't send us any IOCs. Um, they also staggered their patches out across the entire month of June with security fixes, but then didn't tell anybody until the very last patch was delivered. So all of a sudden on the 30th of June, they say, oh, look at all these, look at this vulnerability we fixed. And everybody's like, wait, what? Like this is a device that lives in the core of your network. You don't just patch this thing like you do a domain controller because everybody knows how easy that is. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. These things are VPN devices. So they basically give people no notice. Um, yeah, you can imagine how <laughs> I would have hated to work there when this happened. Um, but this, this hideous ZGREP string is what we ended up putting together in CTI League because we were working with people that had been owned and we were just like, well, what do you have in your logs? How do we tell other people even what to look for when this thing is, with this thing is compromised? Keep in mind, F5 is like a $6 billion software company, right? It's not like these guys are just some hole in the wall shop. So the point I'm trying to get at is just because you threw a bunch of money at a problem doesn't mean you actually solved the problem. Um, here's the best part. Uh, and if you have anybody that follows me on Twitter, I'm constantly beating people up for this. So this guy at PT, this is the PT security blog about that F5 vulnerability. The guy who found it is the same guy who found the Citrix vulnerability. Here's the better part. That's not even his vuln. So Orange Sai in Black Hat in Asia in 2018 had done a talk about path traversals. This dot dot semicolon forward slash, that's exactly the POC from the F5 exploit. Three years, Three year, 20 months before this F5 bug was found, the entire POC method had been like disclosed at Black Hat. Um, you know, five months before that, Citrix had gotten hit. Now you would assume competing vendors would say, hey, there's, you know, we have a similar product. We both use Apache for our backend. We both use Tomcat or whatever it is. And they would do some level of code review. That's not true. And if you look at the internet now, like VMSphere or VM, one of the VMware products just had the same thing. It was a dot dot semicolon forward slash. Like, go search path traversal on anything right now, and you'll see tw tons of Twitter posts about these different like devices and web UIs and things that are all getting hit with just a variation of a three-year-old black hat talk. Like, it's it's obscene. <laughs> um, so yeah, who found that TMSH pock? We'll never know. What we did find, uh, which was interesting and not really too surprising. Um, looking at these, these F5 devices, because keep in mind, these are, you don't buy these as a mom and pop shop, right? You have to, you're spending 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars on a pair of these things. They're really good targets for like nation state stuff. And we found web shells, uh, we found XMR like Monero miners, which, you know, these things run Intel chips, you can still mine Monero on them. Um, and then we found Puppy Rat, which for the Threat Intel guys tell me is an Iranian tool. Um, Imagine. We also found people loading Python port scanners because the management in the management operating system of these devices is basically Linux, but they don't include a port scanner. There's no Nmap. They're none you know, of your favorite tools. So people would just break in, load their port scanners. We found SMB client things that were written in Python so they could laterally move to Windows infrastructure behind the net the F5 devices. Like it was an absolute free-for-all. And then the scarier part was Having worked for F5, there was a few details that I still remembered PTSD-ish. Um, when you, the way these things are built, the user file system is read-only, right? This is sort of a way that they try to keep people from breaking their device or loading, you know, trying to install an RPM package on a net, on a, taking it out of support and all that. 
what these attackers had built was they built a command line string that would hit the, it would throw the exploit, then it would remount the file system in read-write mode, it would drop the web shell, then it would put it back into read-only mode so that you'd have really no idea looking at it that something had been written to the device. The other part was this secure vault device key. Because these things are load balancers, what people will usually use them for is they'll put an SSL certificate, terminate all their SSL on it. They have these big SSL accelerator chips, so you don't have to buy certs for all your devices. You just stick it on one and load balance it. Well, if your cert has a password, you don't want to enter it every single time. So you type it in once, and then it stores it in secure vault. It also lets you encrypt your backup files. This key is how you decrypt it. So they were literally looking and mining the devices to pull their backup files and their secure keys so they could take all their certs and the passwords out of their certs. Like these weren't, these weren't script keys, right? And this, keep in mind, this happened in a matter of like a week. This wasn't like, it doesn't like some of the, even the print nightmare stuff took longer than that. Um, we also saw REST APIs being abused. One of F5's initial attempts at a workaround was just to say block this you know, specific dot dot semicolon forward slash path. Um, what these guys would do is they'd come here, they'd make the account, and that was all they would do. The people, these folks would try to remediate it, but when you came back in with the REST API that was to totally vendor supported with valid credentials, Right? I mean, it was, it was actually kind of, um, it was almost elegant in sort of a sick way, how, how quickly and how well, like, well done this attack campaign was. Um, but end of the day, we did save a few hospitals, and that was kind of the most important thing for us. If you want more details on what this, um, slides will be available afterwards. You can check out NCC Group. Um, they were super cool with us. They gave us lots of information, helped us hunt this down. So now some of how we did this. And you know, a bunch of showdown experts in here, maybe this isn't gonna be news to you, but I'm gonna tell you how I use it. Census Binary Edge, great tools. I don't use them, mostly because at the time I had a free enterprise account from Showdown through Microsoft. BGP View, my personal favorite, maybe you like Hurricane Electric, whatever it is that you find your BGP routing and ASN and network discovery. But what I'm really gonna do is screenshot the crap out of you with Showdown and Great Noise, so <laughs> get ready. Um, so, gray noise for the uninitiated, um, they basically run a sensor network. It's kind of, it's not really a honeypot, but essentially it's a port, or a, it's a packet capture wide open to the internet that records every single thing that hits it. And it puts it in a database that you can search. Um, some of these are screenshots of all the different stuff. These are actually dated. These are different uh, tags from the different malware families and the different bots and scanners and things that gray noise knows about. Um, from every single country on Earth, uh, all the way down to, you'll notice Antarctica is represented. There's a bad machine in Antarctica, Antarctica indiscriminately scanning the internet. But the thing that I like to, to, to illustrate on this, when you're trying to do some sort of hunting with it, um, yeah, and so there's you know, another 9 million IPs, they don't know what they are. So 15 million and change IPs scanning the internet constantly every day doing things. But what I like is, I went in, I found one of these ones, eh, you notice Greenland has three IPs. Cool, so there's three systems in Greenland that are doing bad things. So I go and look up one of those systems in Greenland and show down, I'm sorry, Gray Noise tells me, okay, this thing is doing MS SQL scanning, MS SQL brute forcing. You punch that IP address into Shodan and one of the features that Shodan has, and you can use this with a free account with a you know, Black Friday $5 account, if you go to it by IP address, like if you put it in a single IP, it'll tell you what vulnerabilities it believes that system might have. Like it looks at the, uh, what's called common platform enumeration field, which is the version of the software that's running IIS, Apache, whatever it is, and then does a correlation saying this might have this vulnerability. However, if I see an IIS box that says it's got a buffer overflow in a web dev, and it's doing SQL scanning, that to me kind of is a high probability that this thing has been owned through this, I believe that's actually one of the shadow broker exploits against web dev. So with two free, literally free tools that I can go stick an IP in here, stick an IP in there, I'm like, okay, that box has probably got an MS SQL worm in it, which I think is kind of cool. Um, the other thing Grain Noise is kind of cool with is uh, forensics. Um, they have this analyze feature where you can take all your log files and just throw them in there and it'll spit out all the stuff that it knows is noise. So you can sort of cut through and say, okay, this is the stuff I can ignore. This is the stuff that maybe if you're on an in, uh, 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 incident response and you're trying to figure out, you know, which of these machines, which of these IPs that hit my thing do I need to worry about? You could say, okay, all this crap that's scanning me from China and all the Bing bot crawlers and all these other things, just toss them and figure out what you actually need to pay attention to. <laughs> This is a cool feature. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually still in beta. Um, my intel on this is a little old and I've been a little busy in the last year. But what he was gonna, what they were trying to do, and you can probably talk to Gray Noise if you're really interested, 
is basically let you download a packet capture at a point in time from what their sensors had picked up. So you could say, okay, I want this time slice for this IP address, and you just and it would chug away, and it would drop you like an S3 bucket link, and you'd get a PCAP file with literally the traffic that the sensor sent to it. So this is... I had to obfuscate some of this because there was some of their internal IPs and Andrew over there asked me not to show off their infrastructure, but this is the same machine that I just showed you from Greenland. And you can see, here's a username SA, password SA, attempt to do a SQL brute forcing connection, which, I don't know, it's like a, it's like a flight recorder for the internet, and I just think I kind of nerd out on this stuff. Um, it's also cool for augmenting like other threat intel. Uh, I was reading this FireEye post. And they had this strange log entry, and they were like, yeah, this is some exploit that they picked up coming from God knows where. Um, you could stick that into gray noise, and it'll tell you all the machines that are trying to throw this exploit. Now, it might not be feasible for you to be adding these all to a firewall policy, but I'm very data-centric, and I like to figure out like everything I can learn about what's going on, and this is the type of stuff I do. I'm just sitting there like, well, okay, who's throwing these exploits? Most of the stuff comes out of China, surprise, surprise. Uh, Russia doesn't really like to do indiscriminate hacking, it apparently. They're more interested in the very targeted stuff. Now, here we go. Showdown Handling 101. Most of you probably know this. Ports, products, fairly self-explanatory. Don't trust the product field all the time. Uh, Showdown has gaps, so I usually go by port. Um, organization I'm going to get to. The cool features are is if you can convince your boss or your workplace or something to buy you the enterprise license, then you get to do the really cool stuff. And full disclosure, I don't have any business association with Showdown. I just really like it as a tool. Um, so their enterprise license, you get this thing which is the tag for self-signed certificates. Now, what runs self-signed certificates? Everything. Everything that you have an SSL connection to but don't want to pay for an SSL cert for. Administrator panels for F5s, Citrixes, local like your home routers, smart TVs. Everything that has an admin panel runs a self-signed SSL certificate. You look for SSLs like a self-signed cert against your organization, you'll be horrified at the things you find online. I did an analysis for... <laughs> I can't name them. They're a very big agency in the United States that has stuff to do with food. Um, I found one of their printers hanging off the internet uh, with an active print job going. And I was speaking to them about this, and I pulled up a demo, and I did another search, and I found an admin panel for one of the Hewlett Packard printers. So we connect into it, and it says, hi, you haven't set an admin password. Would you like to set one? So I asked the CISO of this agency, do you want me to set a password on your printer, or do you want to wait for the black hats to do it? Um, yeah, it takes seconds to find this stuff. Um, and then the other cool thing is you can search by vulnerability. Now, I mentioned that you'll see that vulnerability info when you go to it by IP address. It won't let you search that unless you pay for it. And the idea is, is that John, who runs Shodan, didn't want to make it any easier for people like script kitties to go just mine. You know, like if, you know, if somebody maliciously could go and mine all of those F5 devices, you just created a curated target list for them. So the idea was if it's locked behind a license, it's a little bit less of a dangerous thing. Now, it's not 100%. But um, the ones you search with the Vuln tag are ones that are actually generally confirmed. He'll actually run secondary tests and make sure, like SMB's MS1710, the WannaCry Vuln, the F5 one, a few other ones. It'll actually test. So when you see, yes, it's actually vulnerable, it's 100% vulnerable. So some little pro tips for those who like to use Shodan. Um, if you ever want to find uh, the entire internet, zero slat net, zero, zero is the whole internet. So I used to like to start, I used to just go on safaris and spend like my entire afternoons digging for stuff. So, you know, you can look for these, the facet stuff on the command line, the other pro tip, command line client, way better than the web. I usually start with the web, kind of figure out what I'm looking for and then drop into the command line because you can dig really, really deep. But you can look for these facet data. So he'll identify and then tag devices and you can do like a search, right? You know, show down stats facet. And then for this one, I wanted to look at WAFs. That tells you, okay, how many like F5 devices it knows about, how many Netscalers there are. And you can actually search for, you know, WAF and then stick in the name of it and it'll show you all of them. Like there's all this power that most people think, oh, it's good for looking up screenshots of ICS devices or like RDP servers that are left on the internet. It's a super powerful like investigative and threat analysis tool. Um, the other one too, SSL cert details. What you'll find with a lot of these solutions that people like to use, once again, as self-signed certs, which are perfectly valuable or viable, um, but say Kubernetes. You know, everybody sets up a Kubernetes instance and it has a self-signed cert that somewhere in the issuer name is Kubernetes. You can go find all of them, right? If you're doing, anybody likes to do bug bounty hunting, these are tips that you might, you might find useful. The next time you see something of come out, it's usually the race to, you know, the first to the, uh, what is it? 
first to the flag, something like that. Um, this HTTP HTML is more powerful than most people think. I've used it, we used this to find all those F5 management devices, and what we did was because the management interface didn't actually, it wasn't tagging it as a big IP or an F5 device, and plus there's different product versions, so I actually asked a guy who ran them inside his network, can you just curl this IP address and tell me what the HTML is? Like, he just sent me the raw HTML output, and it was a very strange, it had like a uh, ampersand and some other stuff. Once we knew what the HTML looked like, we could just search it based on HTTP HTML, and there was 10,000 devices. Uh, titles, I use this all the time for routings, routers, um, switches, anything like uh, the gentleman before was talking about Zytel devices. You see some of these Cisco ASA devices. This is how you find them, right? They're all over the place. And if the more the point is not to go and mess with people, but if you're administering a network, if you're trying to assess your own network, your partners, this is how you go and kind of can, you know, see what they have on the internet if they don't want to tell you. And then subjects for SSL subjects, same thing. This, it also does, it's basically wildcard searching when you do it this way. So the, the word VPN exists in all these SSL certificates. So these are all VPN devices. You can go start looking for PBX, look for phone, <laughs> see what you find. And so yeah, kind of this round, we, 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 I usually go in, I'll find the system that I know is, is what I'm looking for and dig through the raw data. This is all the raw backend Shodan stuff. If you're just trying to use the UI or even the command line, you're gonna get lost. If you go look at the actual, like you see this little uh, raw data thing at the top, um, click in there and you can see the entire, all the metadata, everything that it's storing that's not gonna show you in the UI. Find what you're looking for, whether it's vendor strings, landing pages. 302 redirects are actually kind of fun to search on, as a lot of these things will just try to redirect you, and then you, you can actually search them and figure out what the devices are. And then I'm a big fan of downloading everything into JSON and just playing around more deeply that way. Um, here's another one I did. Here's an assessment I ran for uh, Ingram Micro. Um, Probably shouldn't have named them, my bad. Uh, so they asked, so somebody asked me if I could go and see what their perimeter looks like. I'm like, all right, cool. Turns out Ingram Micro is this massive company out of California, I believe, who's acquired tons and tons of tech companies over the years. So my usual way of looking at the autonomous system number and figuring out, okay, where's your IP block, doesn't work. Now, Shodan, on the other hand, has figured out how to just, they just sort of smack everything together of all the Ingram Micro organizations over the years. So. There was a lot of interesting stuff when I actually searched it that way, including that somebody in their Serbian office is running a Minecraft server. Um, and then you've got this. Oh, there's a pro tip. When you see an RDP screenshot on Shodan, what that means is they're not using network level authentication, um, which somebody earlier today was talking about RDP being exposed and not having good security. This this NLA is how we at Microsoft, when Deja Blue and Bluekeep came out, this was the remediation we gave people, was turn on NLA, the vulnerability was in the authentication subsystem. So if you turned on NLA, it basically required a password before it would ever show you a screenshot and the vulnerable code path was never hit. So every one of those is probably, if it's not patched, it's definitely vulnerable. So pro tips. Now, I'm gonna kind of close off with this command and control malware and sort of the reason why I left Microsoft and the technology that we're working on now. Um, for those who are gonna kind of blow through this, I call that there's bespoke sort of malware, right? There's a sort of free range, you know, organic, you know, gluten-free stuff that the Russians and the Iranians and the Chinese make for themselves and they don't share it. They certainly don't sell it on the dark web. Uh, there's the professional tooling, a Metasploit, Cobalt Strike. Um, it was used to be nice when Cobalt Strike was expensive and only the, you know, the red teams could have it. And of course, it's since leaked on the internet like all software does. And there's what I call commodity, which is the stuff you buy on the dark web. Um, you know, it's kind of written by script kitties, you know, two or three levels of script kitties. It's not super good, it's not super great, but it does the job in a lot of cases. Um, obviously, the most common attack vector is email. If you're going to get in through a broken network device or an RDP, you don't need to use C2 malware. It's noisy. It's prone to getting caught by antivirus sometimes. Um, and it's, you know, these little obfuscated payloads. It'll try to go out through C2s. It'll try to find a DNS address to get to its C2, which is where the fun part gets into. Um, the nation state guys are not going to use uh, DNS. Well, unless you're like SolarWinds and they really only used the uh, domain generation algorithm to figure out which companies had ran the SolarWinds malware. 
most of your targeted attacks, they're either going to stand up bespoke infrastructure for that, that single attack, or they're going to have one IP address that they use. They're not going to use the sort of shotgun spray and pray, put 20 domains in a payload and hope that one of them works because they know they're going to lose some. Because of that, the way we do things, um, we actually take over the domains. We don't subpoena them like Microsoft. We just have friends that work with DNS registrars. Um, it's 100% legal, and we basically just say, hey, we found malware that's using these C2 domains. You want to give them to us? And they will. Um, and it turns out that you don't need to take over the entire C2 infrastructure to see signals of what's coming out of these different malware systems. Right? If you get about 5 or 10%, you can see a crazy amount of like distribution across the world on what's coming out of these, uh, these networks. Plus, it also lets us do some fun mischief. Um, the nice thing about this is the bad guys don't notice. Right? When we take over these things, they just assume that somebody from you know, Threat Intel Group had thrown out an IOC and said, oh, you know, this is a bad domain, and they've gone to the DNS place and said, shut it down, it's doing malicious stuff. They don't actually notice that we can sort of commandeered and we're still running it. Um, we don't have to, like, it doesn't require anybody to do anything, so we can, we've been able to sort of spy on malware for the last couple of years and just see what the world is doing and see what all these different malware families are doing. Um, and we get really, it also takes out that C2. So if you've got a bunch of domains that get taken over, the other malware that use that, you know, round robin lands on that address isn't going to work. Um, and there's two ways that we've started spying on this traffic, which is just looking at the DNS signals, and then we've actually kind of taken a gray noise model and made sensors that collect data, and that's kind of, that's pretty sweet. Uh, and it's just cool, right? This is, like I said, I was at Microsoft a bunch of years. I was ready for something different, and I was like, wow, do we want to go work on something that's just really new and sort of novel way of looking at malware? So I'm like, oh, let's go play with it. Um, DNS has its limitations, and if you're asking, is this a sinkhole? Yeah, it's basically a sinkhole, um, except that we're actually doing a lot of sort of like data processing and, and data science on top of it. Um, there's a lot of false positives, though, when you're looking at sort of sinkhole data, right? Anytime a security company does a malware detonation or takes apart a piece of malware, that DNS signal goes out. Um, anytime you've got like attachment detonation services or email appliances or somebody pastes a malicious URL into Slack and forgets to defang it, that's a DNS lookup that looks like a signal. Also, big open resolvers, you know, this is, these mask actual victims. We, all we see is, you know, Cloudflare or Google. We don't see what's, who's actually been victimized. Um, and once again, APTs are going to be invisible. There's, if anybody has an idea on how to catch these guys, let's talk, seriously. <laughs> But it's still interesting. Um, one of the things I like to say is it shows how bad we as the industry are at doing anything with DNS IOCs. We pick up about a billion signals a day from stuff that's in the public domain. Like this isn't secret sauce. We're just taking the information that's on the public internet and threat feeds and we're taking it over and we see a billion signals a day. So that's like, I like that everybody's taking apart malware and throwing this information out there. I wish the industry would do something more with it than sort of skim to the bottom and be like, oh, malware hashes and then stop processing. But it does let us know that something happened. And that's a lot of times that's sort of pushing, we're, we're pushing left, right, of the attack chain. We're getting something faster. Um, we're getting something earlier, but it may, may, or may or may not have been picked up by, you know, endpoint software or AV, but it's, it's, we're seeing it. Um, and like I said, it lays, gives us the groundwork for this stuff. It also makes pretty pictures. Ransomware. So it's kind of neat to lay this out, right? We all know that Russian-speaking countries don't get a lot of ransomware, and now I actually have data to show this off, right? So here's Ryuk. Here's where we see traffic coming out. I mean, the North America is no surprise. The big, like, sort of the, the favorite come, like, country of ransomware gangs to go after. I can never pronounce this. Sudino Kibi, another one. I just kind of took the top four ransomwares that I've heard of and like that we play with. Wasted Locker. That's just dis like it's just destroying most of the world. But you notice this pattern of Russian-speaking countries don't have any of it. <laughs> uh, and then Maze, although you know they're they're not as popular anymore. But yeah, pretty pictures. Um, then we started looking at some of the rats and the Trojan stuff because I just find this interesting, right? Iced ID is really this is the new hotness in the U.S. Once again, not much distribution in Russian-speaking countries. Um, it's kind of global. Africa seems to be avoiding this. I've never been able to figure why. If it's just that it's a geopolitical or economical thing, that it's not really cost-effective to attack African countries' businesses. If anybody knows, I'm genuinely curious. Um, Nanocore, this is, you know, like I was saying, the sort of, you know, script kitty bots that they, they buy on the dark net. Obviously, it's still very popular. There's a ton of it out there. Quackbot, I mean, everybody loves Quackbot, and Trickbot. 
right? TrickBot actually seems to be more popular in Australia than just about any other type of malware, which is another interesting point. I like to I love conversations if anybody knows about this stuff, because this is just data for you. And then Cobalt Strike, everybody's favorite. Um, it's just, it is an interesting thing living in the United States and we constantly, all we hear in the news is about ransomware and like cyber attacks. And then when I actually look at data, I'm like, you're right, we are the largest target of it. So what we did in CTI League with this information um, is actually how I met my new boss. Uh, he basically came in and we realized that healthcare organizations aren't security companies. And I know that sounds kind of like, like one of those, well, no kidding. But the point I'm making is that when you see a malware signal coming out of a hospital, it's probably not a malware analyst detonating malware in a sandbox. It's probably a signal that something worse is happening. And especially if you see a trend of it coming up, that's when we start to realize that that hospital is under attack. Like, this is a list of hospitals right now that I can pick up that have things coming out of their network. Um, so in 2020, as you know, Mark and I talked about this morning, we started CTI League. My boss joined. Basically, we gave away, he gave away free access to every healthcare company that wanted it um, and said, hey, if you want access to this stuff, I'll just give it away for you. It's, like, it's the right thing to do. Um, and then we would coordinate once, you know, usually we'd find or he would find things. He'd come in and say, hey, we found a hospital that's got a bunch of like Ryuk beaconing out or like pre-stages pre of Ryuk. How do we get a hold of them? We'd work with the HI SACs. They'd reach out to the hospital. Um, the thing, one of the interesting lessons we learned in CTI League, um, and it was something that I was really surprised about, is hospitals are very reluctant to take any free information. Mark mentioned how they, they would think we were blackmailing them. Um, sometimes they would get very defensive, but even after they got it, there was a sort of hush-hush thing. They didn't, wanna, they didn't even want to admit that they needed the help. Um, and unfortunately, there's some, my theory on this is because there's just reliability for them, right? You're in a life-saving industry. If you're admitting that you're having holes in your network, just last week in the United States, there was a lawsuit that was kicked off by a woman who's claiming that the fact that her infant passed away was because the hospital had a ransomware attack happening at the time. So once again, we're dealing with the economical things of ransomware actors trying to take over networks for money. And then we're dealing with the economical aspect, economical aspect of hospitals that are afraid to ask for help because if they do, that could open them themselves up for another lawsuit, right? This, is, this isn't an easy problem to solve and we've been kind of tackling it in one way or another for the last year and a half. But we did help a bunch of them get away from it. And I think there was five or six hospitals on the East Coast of the US that we managed to help. Um, we worked with some folks from NHS, uh, National Health Services in the UK to give them some intel. Um, so it was successful. The other way we can do this as we, we start controlling it and using these sensors is we actually answer the malware. We keep running the zones. We hand it back IP addresses that we own. And then we let the malware talk to us and send us a whole bunch of information. And depending on the malware family, it's more or less. Um, we can't actually touch the malware. We can't send it commands. That's technically illegal. Um, but we can take everything that it gives us. Um, and then we could do things like using Rapid7 data to correlate which cloud IP address from DigitalOcean talked to one of the sensors and realizing this is an Amstel machine. Right? This is just all data science, right? This isn't enough, it's not super, it's not really, it's not machine learning, it's not AI. It's just clever ways of taking data and matching it up together to find actual interesting stuff like this. Um, let's see here. Well, that's an eye chart and I apologize. So this is a snapshot of one of the, one of the systems that talk to a sensor, right? And it's got, we take away the masking from the DNS recursion, right? We actually get the IP of the victim. It's talking directly to us. So the malware is trying to talk directly to us. And it's sending us usernames and passwords, machine names, operating system versions of Windows, um, and then weird payloads. What you might not be able to see here is this machine is saying, it's saying, it's basically saying it's an operating system, it's a Windows 7 SP1, but then what it's trying to tell us the user agent is, is an iPhone, <laughs> right? <laughs> I didn't know iPhones ran on Windows or Windows ran on iPhones. Um, but yeah, this is the, we, it's just very strange. I, I obsess over this kind of stuff. So yeah, we see these kinds of payloads. It's like, that's really weird. This is actually, um, uh, dang, I forget the name of the malware family off the top of my head, but then we had some ideas that we can. This is, I can talk about this because we can't do it. Um, one of the ideas we kicked around was what if we just BGP hijack attacker networks and try to man in the middle of their traffic so that we can spy on what they're doing between the victim and the endpoint. 
Now, you can imagine if we're seeing a billion signals a day, what amount of that amount of BGB hijacking would probably be noticed. Um, it'd also be illegal. The other thought was we could pull kind of like what the Dutch police that took down the Hansa drug market did, where at one point they put tracking images uh, in these Excel files that they were giving to these drug dealers. And they said, hey, you can download your stats and your sales from the, you know, the Hansa market this month, and you can be on like a leaderboard. And they actually tricked these drug dealers into opening Excel files that had images that called back to their servers, and they realized the home IPs of these folks. Like, there was a great talk that they did a few years ago. That's, once again, tampering with stuff in transit. We're not allowed to do that. We're not the cops. Um, the other thought was maybe we just took a ransomware payload into the exfiltrated data and send it back to the attacker so that when they open it up to see what they got, it just ransomwares their network. Once again, all of this stuff is illegal. <laughs> um, and then we thought, well, maybe we could remotely delete the payloads that are on the machine. Like, literally, we have a team of lawyers we've talked to. No, that's also illegal. The one cool thing we've been able to do is not patch botnets, but look at botnets. Anybody heard of Maris? <laughs> Real recent. So we managed to take over 90% of their interest of their C2 domain infrastructure, and we've just been watching it for the last two weeks. Um, it's hard to commit to a number. I think the Ross Telecom said that they looked and saw about 44,000 IPs talking to their sensors. We've picked up over 120,000 unique IPs talking to sensors. They're not entirely sure that that's the number of infected clients. There's, we're still digging through the data, but we can kind of do a breakdown <laughs> of where these things are coming from. Um, you know, obviously ISPs are the big ones, and we obfuscate a lot of this. I don't want to name and shame any ISPs, so these are just um, NAX code for organizations. But we've got healthcare industries, we've got government sectors, we've got manufacturing, and the thing that's scary about Maris is it's more advanced than just Mirai, right? This isn't just a script kitty botnet. It's actually using um, built-in router OS commands to basically take over these routers and make them accessible to the botnet operators. So there's a non-zero chance, if they wanted to, they can figure out where are these devices running? Is this a network I want to get into? And they can go get back into it. And every one of these companies that are on this list, now they're at risk for this stuff. So in closing, the 90s called and they want their exploits back. None of those exploits we saw from you know, network vendors are really that complicated, right? This isn't super elite. There's no ROP chains. There's no exploit chaining. There's nothing that you hear about it like Windows or Apple or um, you know, Linux exploitation. This is just dumb programming problems. <laughs> Uh, the other thing about it is zero days are expensive. I worked for Microsoft for a long time doing patching zero days. I can tell you we didn't see a lot of them. Most of them came from North Korea. Most of them were crappy VB script stuff and code that should have been ripped out. But you know what isn't expensive? Mistakes. And that's what these people are getting in on. They're waiting for people like you or people like you who you work for to make a mistake and to screw up. And I guarantee you they're looking at your network more than you are. And you need to be doing the same thing. And that's kind of what I was trying to illustrate here is how to do this. Do this when you every week, every month, make it part of your sort of basic security hygiene just to figure out what you've got. Or obviously, anytime there's an exploit disclosure, do you know all your inventory? Especially if you just came to a company, you start a new job, this is a good way to look good really quickly. When you tell your boss, hey, did you know we have a bunch of net scalers out there that haven't been patched in six months? He might not know, right? Um, and of course, if you're partnering with people, if you're doing a merger acquisition, something like that, um, just do this, please, so that you don't have to have me talking about you next time at BrewCon. And if you like, I throw some of my Shodan stuff up on uh, GitHub. It's there if you want to check it out. And with that, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I think we got about 10 minutes. Anyone that has any questions? Thank you very much. Um, my question is, you're saying that normally what you do is just leave the C2 malware just running and just look at what it does? You do not, uh, or sometimes you do not inoculate what it, get rid of it? Yeah, we can't touch it, right? We'd like to, For us to do anything, I mean, when we see, whatever signal we see coming from it, it's essentially been inoculated at that point because it's trying, we don't keep sending it to the actual C2 infrastructure. Once we take it over, we don't even get the original zone files. We have no idea where it was going, and we never respond with something that gets it back to the mothership. So it is, it, to a degree, inoculated, but we can't, we can't do anything like send a self-destruct command to it, because that would be us being the bad guys. All right, all right. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, 
Hey, Nate. Hey, Joe. <laughs> so one tension, um, and maybe like to use an example with one of the Kaseya, with the Kaseya incident, there was just in the news a lot of disgruntled people over like, oh, the FBI had some information about the decryption key and didn't share it because they were investigating and, you know, trying to make indictments or whatever around these lines. Do you think that there's a worry that, because I think what you're doing is very good, but do you think that it's setting up a potential tension between yourself, CTI League, and whatnot um, with law enforcement authorities that are trying to gather evidence and information in order to do prosecutions, which you could argue really doesn't make any sense because it hasn't solved the problem just yet, but it could lead to trouble later on. We work with law enforcement. We've actually had conversations with the FBI. Um, we've had conversations with some other letter agencies that I can't name. Um, and we, there, was an, there was something with Maris that we were working on. We were actually asked to, to stand down on it until Europol was finished with their work. So yeah, we definitely we, we want to fully collaborate with law enforcement and government wherever we can, just because we have a visibility like we do. And so we were, more, we were just saying, governments, law enforcement, people that we can help out, we'd love to. Cool. <laughs> hey, Nate. Hey, buddy. Hey, question for you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that scares the absolute shit out of me is edge computing. Um, <laughs> now, my question for you is how, <clears throat> excuse me, how does what you just described in very good detail relate to that? Which part of what I described? Oh, like basically like, uh, let, let's say the adversarial networks, their approaches, um, the, your technology stack and how it connects to edge computing specifically. Is there a difference or is it about the same? It's, I mean, in my experience, it's, it's fairly the same. I mean, the, at least the, the, I have limited experience with edge computing. It mostly was Microsoft pushing things out closer to people. Um, but I mean, it, to me, it, I don't think there's a, a, that much of a difference, only it gets harder and harder the more, like we, one of the things we have is visibility problems, even when I would do assessments for companies where they'd say, yeah, well, here's our autonomous system, but we're also in Azure and we're in AWS, right? I can't find you anymore, right? If, and if your DNS, if it's not a, 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 like a you know, www.yourcompany.com domain name in your DNS zones, I'm not gonna be able to brute force it, like, right? I can't run brute forcing on your DNS servers all the time, so. I'll know what IPs you might own, but if you're doing a hybrid cloud approach or you have stuff in the cloud that's not in your DNS records, like we're totally blind to it. And that's, that's continuing to get to be a bigger and bigger gap is the more people push to the cloud, the harder it becomes to do what I'm talking about. Once the cloud gets its own cloud, it's all over. It worries the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah and I, I feel like the cloud companies, you know, I, the cloud companies could be doing a little bit better job to proactively tell their own customers. I mean, they could use gray noise to see if something's scanning outside of their cloud, right? If you, if I was an AWS and Azure customer and my VM suddenly starts scanning the internet for Microsoft SQL, I would want to know that, right? But I'm not aware of any cloud provider that does that. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, let's drink. <laughs> Thank you.